for that Veda. So, Katho Upanishad is a part of Krishna Yajur Veda and the Shanti Mantra chanted for that is this Sahana Bhavata, which we already chanted, but we will again recite it and discuss it for a few minutes and proceed further. <coughs> So both the teacher and the student are ideally 
the teacher of Brahma Vidya does not require any protection because what is to be achieved by protection is only achieved. But otherwise you can say that both of them are prayer, praying for the protection. Now understand that this mantra is chanted in the context of the knowledge. Where the teacher is imparting the knowledge and the disciple is receiving the knowledge. So in that sense, what is meant by protection? So what kind of protection is being sought here? So Shankaraja explains, Vidya Swarupa Prakashanena. May that Lord reveal the Swarupa, the nature of Vidya. So by revealing the knowledge, may He protect us. Basically, it's the disciple that is that needs a protection. So by revealing the nature of knowledge, may He protect us. So naturally, that is the most exalted protection by revealing nature of knowledge. Because what does the knowledge reveal? That you are, so that fearlessness, one of the things that is told is fearlessness in your nature. As you mentioned, Abhayam Pratishtam in the day, the one who gains the knowledge of oneself becomes free from all fear. So fear being also an expression of sorrow, becomes free from sorrow, becomes free from fear. Because fear can be there only when there is what we call duality. Dityadvai bhayam bhavati. When there is duality. You know what is duality? Duality means mutual exclusion. Two does not make duality. Mutual exclusion makes duality. There can be two persons and still may not feel excluded by each other. Suppose there is bondage of love between the two of them, then in spite of the personalities being true, there is still oneness that can be. But when that is not there, when you create in me a sense that you are different and I am different, or when that response arises from me that I am not you and you are not me, what it amounts to saying is that you exclude me and I exclude you. You are not what I am and I am not what you are. That being excluded creates in me a sense of separatedness, a sense of isolation. It is not that just because I am one among many that I am isolated. No, when I feel separated from others, not part of them, not them, and whenever I then you have this body mind sense complex, and look upon you also as another body mind sense complex. Definitely the I, as characterized by this body mind sense complex, is different from that. So stronger the identification I have with my body mind sense complex, which is called ahankara or ego, stronger the identification is there, greater is the sense of separatedness or, or exclusiveness and greater is the sense of insecurity. Stronger the ego is, smaller I feel about myself and greater is the sense of insecurity. So what does this knowledge reveal? This knowledge reveals that in fact there is no exclusion, that in fact I do not exclude anything if I knew what the true nature of myself is. That I, as consciousness, which is my true nature, is all inclusive. Nothing excluded from me and I do not get excluded by anybody. When I see that, there is no reason for fear because the dvaita or the mutual exclusion is not there. As I said, two does not make dvaita. It is mutual exclusion that is what makes dvaita. <coughs> And that is the product of not knowing myself, taking myself away this body, taking you also in the body, and naturally two bodies are different, never two selves also become different as the well. They go on and think that I'm Bengal, other one thinks that I'm earring, and then earring is not Bengal, Bengal is not earring from the standpoint of name and form. So as long as identification with name and form, Certainly I am different from other name and form. 
Only when that Bengal realizes I'm gold, then when its understanding of self changes, realizes that <coughs> the hearing is not separate from me. No other or no other anamid is separate from me. In that case, in spite of ornaments being many, in spite of manyness, there is no sense of separation, no sense of exclusion, and there is no isolation, and there is no insecurity, and there is no fear. Sahanu avatu, may the Lord protect us. Meaning protects from fear by revealing the true nature of self. When we realize that what is is one or non dual that's I, then the very cause for fear disappears. Because fear was the product of ignorance. And knowledge removes that fear. Sahanu avatu may protect us both. <coughs> Sahanu bhantu may nourish us both. Being in context of the knowledge, what is nourishing? Vidya phala prakashanena. So now by revealing to us the result of this knowledge, which of course is freedom. So by knowledge and by revealing the result of the knowledge, which is freedom, may protect us, may nourish us both. <coughs> Meaning that the real nourishment in life comes. Only as we keep knowing truly what we are, then the real nourishment comes. What is nourishment is basically that emotionally we feel more and more together as a person. More and more comfortable with myself. And by revealing the true nature of myself, I realize that I am what I want to be, and therefore, more clearly I know myself, more comfortable I feel with myself. And what is nourishment is feeling comfortable with myself. The greatest nourishment is I am totally comfortable with myself, totally satisfied with myself. Thus developing self-comfort is the nourishment, emotional nourishment. Physical nourishment is one thing. But emotional nourishment is feeling comfortable in myself. And the beauty is that as I discover comfort with myself, I automatically discover comfort with others. So thus, a, a comfort is created. So may we be nourished by discovering that comfort as a result of the knowledge. Te yasvero adhiramastu. So, May we both put forth sufficient effort. That is naturally that any pursuit requires effort. And therefore, pursuit of the knowledge also requires effort. <clears throat> what kind of an effort? Apart from the effort of our subjecting to this teaching, which is what we call shravan, oh, that's an effort. But to benefit from Shravanam, benefit from listening to teacher also requires an effort. Who can benefit most from the teaching? The one who is most prepared for the teaching. What is the preparation? That my mind is favorably disposed to and receiving and understanding what the teacher says. When teacher says you are limitless, my mind does not reason. Why? Well, what do you mean I am limitless? <coughs> Sometimes you have these complexes and we just cannot stand what we are told. Even though what is being told is something good. But some, you know, there is Ishwara, there is an order of Ishwara. Who says there is an order? <laughs> because the person feels there is no order in mind. Ishwara is all grace. What do you mean Ishwara is all grace? Because my conclusion about Ishwara is different. So when I'm told, I may resist very often, I revolt. So in that sense, you know, so all I require is a mind that does not resist. As far as the pursuit of knowledge is concerned, all that we require is a mind that is, does not resist, is comfortable to with what is being told. That you are happiness, I'm, I'm happy to know that I'm happy. 
Sometimes you become more unhappy by knowing, oh, I'm supposed to be happy. <laughs> so formerly I was okay when I got, I got angry. It doesn't matter. I thought that is the way. Now I realize that that's not right. So I feel even more unhappy. <laughs> So then what is favorable to the mind? This Upanishad also tells that Upanishad do dance. Dhatu prasadat mahima anamatmana. Prasad means favorable dance. Dhatu huva ishvara or dhatu also means my mind and my personality should become favorable to me. So there are many prayers. We pray to Ishvara at all the presiding deities that May all my limbs may become favorable to the pursuit of this knowledge. Bhadram karanevi shunyama deva. O devatas, O gods, please bless us that whatever we hear through ears is auspicious. <coughs> so thus, seeking the favor of Ishvara, so that this body, mind, conscience complex becomes favorable to me, does not raise obstacle to myself. My mind can be a great enemy of myself, always putting obstacles, by resisting, by getting distracted. And so, that mind's favor also I need, that it remains with me, doesn't get distracted, doesn't run away from me. And also, it does not resist what it is learning. It is favorable disposed, disposed to hear and understand and assimilate what is being told. <clears throat> so in that sense, that effort is required to make our own mind favorable to us. That's a big effort. As Lord Krishna says, Atmaiva Hyatmanobandhu, Atmaiva Yibhu Atmana. My mind can become my friend, my own mind, meaning a benefactor. Something that benefits me, or my own mind can become my enemy. Meaning something that puts obstacles to my path. Therefore, that effort is required that my mind becomes favorable to this. And this is called the Antagashuddhi purification of mind. More rajas, tamas impurities are there, more difficult the mind is. Less impurities are there. Because the mind becomes purer, because more and more composed, tranquil, favorable. <coughs> so maybe constantly make effort for cultivating Shamadi Shakka Sambhati, Shama Dhamma Uparama Tidiksha. Shama means tranquility of the mind, making the mind free from the Raghav Dveshas, attachment and aversions. Dhamma is self control, freedom, all boundaries and no indulgence. Uparama and inwardness, abiding in the self. Tidiksha, forbearance. The ability to be able to put up with discomfort and all these tricks and pins in the life. <clears throat> so these will be cultivated. So that inner and outer obstacles to the mind are slowly removed. And that is the effort also that is required. So maybe make that effort which is required for gaining this knowledge. Apart of course from listening. And you may require effort in terms of learning Sanskrit, this, that, what not. What in case so. Learning the language, learning the logic, reasoning. See, in the olden days, and traditionally, if you go to a traditional place like Kailas Ashram in Rishikesh, and you want to study Vedanta, first they'll send you where to the grammar class, Sanskrit. You know, study Sanskrit grammar. Then they'll tell you to go to the center of the class for studying Nyaya or Tarka or logic. Meaning, those, some of those basic uh, skills or discipline are, are required to study the scriptures. So, that is also part of preparation. That as we grow into this and as we take more and more interest in learning, we require that Swamiji, I think we need to learn the Sanskrit. So, that all. I think some little bit of logic or reasoning also is required. Some Mimamsa, a bit of Karmakanda is required. Just to be able to understand what the, the text and the, the, the commentaries tell us. Not right away, but if you find that these are required, then we make an effort to acquire those basic things. Not that you want to be a great grammarian or what a logician, etc. Just what we require. Or, uh, what we require for cooking, that's all, you know, just few things. But so that you don't remain hungry. 
that I don't have to make any fancy stuff, but that we may at least make rice. I don't make chapati. There is some toast rice we have made, and some sabji, and just boil some, you know, cans and add some spices, etc. Something. Yeah, so you go along with it. You don't have to become Sanskrit, uh, yak, or not, an expert in that. Some basic thing that required. If you discover the need, then some effort in that direction also. <coughs> Tejas, you know, Adhita must do, may our study become effective. Study become effective. What effective is study? Basically, study of Vedanta is meant to bring about our inner transformation. We should discover a constant transformation in ourselves, become better and better person, more and more kind person, more and more compassionate person. And then uh, more, uh, more and more clarity in understanding. So that is what is expected. That's what makes us happy. Ultimately, what they are seeking through any pursuit is happiness. And so that inner transformation, what are the obstacles of happiness? All these uh, anger and lust and greed, etc., are all my obstacles. And they were slowly, I should conquer them. <clears throat> and then this teaching becomes so part of me. Walking the talk, as they say, slowly, not right away, but then that is called the uh, effectiveness of the teaching. That what I study and what I learn, what I understand, it gets reflected in my life, not for showing to others, but the way, the extent to which it gets reflected, it makes me happier person. So may this teaching make us create the fruit in us, which is happiness. <coughs> May the teaching become brilliant, it also means that may gain further and further clarity. Anena dhitena aho ratran sandhadami. One prayer says that may I connect the day and night with this, with this study, meaning that day and night may I study. So that, meaning that my mind becomes more and more available for this, it becomes more and more free from other needs and distractions. <coughs> Ma with says maybe not distance each other, maybe not cabinet each other, maybe not have any misunderstanding with each other between the teacher and the student. Can there be misunderstanding? Maybe not hate each other. Well, you don't hate a teacher or student, but still the prayer is that maybe not cabinet each other, maybe not have aversion for each other, maybe not hate each other. You see what happens is. Those days, the, the student would go and live with the teacher. Not only for a day or two, for a number of years. And closer you are, more you come to learn about each other, and more and more, and it's quite possible. And what happens is, that more and more you like your teacher, more and more comfortable you become, so more comfortable relationship becomes, then more free we become, more we feel protected, you know, then more liberty we start taking. Because I know I am protected here, I am safe, and therefore I can get away. And so I will pour out my mind, what's in my mind, I can easily pour out where I am comfortable. With other people I am always little, you know, I am always reserved. And I say what is politically right, etc., etc., because I know I don't want to, you know, disturb any feathers, whatever they call it. But once I know you, and once I know that I am accepted by you, and then you are going to accept me regardless of what I am, then slowly my two things come out. That's why I mean, all intimate relations, that's how all problems also come out. Of transference, this, that, whatnot. But anyway, so even between teacher and student also it can happen. And there are other students also may be there. And then slowly, one, then you start become more and more. You need, once attention is paid to you, you need more attention and then more attention. And then look at who is getting more attention. And then some just or enemy starts, some jealousies. These things go on. These are all the inner dynamics are there in a Guru Kuna also. <coughs> And if your conclusion is that any teacher is, you know, sometimes you feel that you are being targeted, you know, because uh, he's telling me, Swami, the whole class was for me, and I get scared. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I felt that today the whole class was made for me. Then I go, I have weight. What does it mean? She is happy then it's okay. <laughs> Otherwise, men because I was targeted. Sometimes people feel it. All of these are results of closeness, understand? You know? So closeness also has its own difficult days if we do not have proper boundaries and uh, so that way expectations grow and the time comes when the other person may not be able to fulfill my expectations and then I get angry. So the teacher also may have expectations from the student, you know, as to what the person should do and should not do. And then but more expectations are there, more dissatisfaction is likely to be. And the same relationship can just turn around, which started so well can turn around if you don't pay attention. So may this not happen. May my emotions not take over me when I am talking to the students. If I have some problem with the student, then, you know, my own emotion may take and then it's possible that I may target somebody. Or I may want to, what I cannot tell you is out otherwise, you know, I tell you in the class. So at personal level, I don't say that, you know, because I don't appear to be a harsh person. But in the class I can take advantage. So very often the people, you know, when they are addressing uh, the audience, they use that as an occasion to give them peace of their mind. <laughs> so, all these things can happen. I mean, therefore, it is said, may this not happen. May the teacher not misunderstand or may not, you know, if you are with the student, may the student also not. And let there be harmony between them. Because most important in this case is, the relationship between the teacher and the student, that the, the, the student has shraddha, the trust in the teacher, bhakti, devotion, the reverence for the teacher. That is required on the part of the student, which gives the student a disposition of mind, which is now ready to receive without resistance. So, while I am listening to the teacher, my mind is not a questioning mind, not a resisting mind, a receiving mind. Swami Swami used to give example of sponge. Swami, those are like sponge. It's easy to tell us, you know. Talking about the students in United States, like sponge. They absorb. So God, I was happy to hear that. But anyway, the thing is that that's what we want. That we absorb what is told to us. But then sponge does not resist. No, it receives, absorbs. So maybe, may I possess a mind like that. But that requires a shraddha bhakti also. And he can't get our concentration. So may possess those qualities of mind that gives me right disposition to receive this teaching. And the teacher also should have the right disposition. He should be a kind person. He should be a compassionate person. He must have patience also. Sometimes you know, what is you don't still understand how many times I will tell you. So uh, you can get information also. And so then you need patience. So teacher needs patience, kindness, concern for the, that he is no his agenda at all. The agenda of the teacher is only the agenda of the student. The teacher doesn't have an agenda. It's very important. Otherwise, this very communication can be also exploited for fulfilling one's agenda. So ideally, teacher should have no agenda other than simply sharing his knowledge and hopefully doing the best that he can, he she, or she can do for the student. And then the student has no agenda other than studying and gaining the knowledge. If that atmosphere exists, then nothing else will come in the way. If there are other agendas, then those agendas come in the way, because when the agendas are not fulfilled, then they can create this disturbances. So may we be free from all other agendas. Then, then you know, not any distance from each other, some aversion may not be created. Let there be an atmosphere of shraddha and bhakti on the part of student and care and concern on the part of the teacher. <coughs> so that's the kind of frame of mind we require. It's called shanti patha. When this is there, the mind enjoys peace. Particular peace there is no home because my own being becomes favorable, therefore there is no disturbance from within, no disturbance from without, no disturbance from the supposedly divine sources, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti.
Again, before we go to the text, there is one more prayer here that we have reproduced from the Mahasya of Shankarasarya. So let us read that also. Om Namo Bhagavate Usually we do not see Vashikara beginning with this kind of prayer. Mm -hmm. One place where we have seen Vashikara saluting the teachers is in Bhagavadana Kopanisha. Namo Brahma Dibhyo, Brahma Vidya, Sampradaya, Karthabhyo. So he, he salutes the teachers, the parampara of the teachers, succession of the teachers. Here also, interestingly enough, Vashyagara, they are like a prayer that Vashyagara performs. It is traditional to start any endeavor with a prayer. Prayer is to seek the grace of Ishwara to remove the obstacles on our path. But for the prayer is the freedom from obstacles on our path. So that whatever task we have commenced, it can be finished without obstacles. Similarly, Vashyagar also has commenced the task of writing a commentary on the Upanishad. And he also warned that no obstacles should come. Oh, Swami Shankarachar also feels that way. Maybe he doesn't feel that way. But sometimes these great people do things not necessarily because they require for themselves, <coughs> but because they want to set an example. That this subsequent generation also should do this. That every endeavor should begin with a prayer. So even though prayer may not necessarily be the need of Adi Shankarachari, but he still does it to set an example for others. So you need a prayer before you commence anything because if by prayer you are invoking a grace of Ishwara. Ishwara can be in form of Guru, Ishwara can be in form of Creator, can be from a Devata. Sometimes they pray to Lord Ganesha, God Saraswati, etc. So, in one way or the other, seeking grace or invoking grace. Recognizing that I need help. Recognizing that I have limitations. And therefore I may not be capable enough of warding of all the obstacles. And therefore I need help. So seeking help. As the Swami used to say, seeking help is intelligent living. Where you need help, seek help. When if you need help, then seek help. Don't deny. There will be denial that I need help. Well, if you can need help, and then I seek help. So then everybody who commences any endeavor requires that I need help because there can be obstacles. <coughs> In Sanskrit it says, Shriyam Shri Particularly when you start an auspicious thing, there is likely you have many obstacles <coughs> for whatever reason. In Pradhar Nikopaji said that the Devatas do not like that these human beings pursue this, this knowledge. A way of saying, Devatas do not like that you pursue the knowledge of Brahman. You know why? Because what does this knowledge teach you? That I am Brahman, I am limitless. What did he say? I am not a doer, I am actionless. So it, is, it reveals the true nature of self which is actionless, which is so. Once I discover that I am actionless, I have nothing to do now. Then I stop doing things. So formerly I was performing a variety of rituals because I thought I needed things. As a result of this knowledge, I realize I don't need anything. So I stop doing things. What is meant by stop doing things is stop performing rituals, stop performing pleasing those devatas. So formally for pleasing the devatas. Because they fulfill my needs. So when I thought I was needy, I needed their favor. And therefore I propitiated this Devadas by way of these rituals. When 
when I made offering to the devadas, and so devadas got their share. So human beings sustain the devadas, understand, by making offerings. If I stop offering, that is that one, that means less tax collection, you know. <laughs> they don't like it. There when they are watching out, if somebody is going to slide in with the Brahma Vidya, then they put some obstacles. <laughs> then they are saying. <laughs> so, Brother and Gopanisha says that the Devatas do not like that this person is pursuing Brahma Vidya. Because he will be no more in our fold now. And then we will no more give us any offerings. And we will be deprived of the offerings. And so, they will put obstacles so that somehow you are discouraged, something. So it is said. Then Shankarajal is also purpose of saying it. It says that in this pursuit you need the favor of Devadas, need the grace of Devadas. So always pray to them. But the point is obstacles can come. And never need for prayer. So there was this called Mangala Acharanam. Acharanam means conduct. Mangala means auspicious. An auspicious beginning. So remembering God or Devata's prayer is an auspicious thing. <coughs> so what we just read is the prayer that Ashikara or Adi Shankaracharya makes. He offers salutation. Om Namo Bhagavate Vivasvataya Vrityave Brahma Vidya Charyaya Nachiketa Sechaya Om Namo my salutation. To whom? Vaivasvadaya. Vaivasvada means son of Vivaswan. Vivaswan means son, S U N son. So the Puranas describe how son has number of progeny. One of them is this Yavaraja or Lord of Death. So, Vaivasvata, son of Vivaswan, son of son. Who is, who is Yamaraja? Who is the presiding deity of death? So, Yamaraja means lord of death. So, as you say in, in Kathopanishad, who is the teacher? Death is the teacher. That is the uniqueness of this Upanishad also. Because death is a very important thing in life. And death knows what is before death and what is after death. Because he is the one who pulls your life away and then, then disposes you of wherever according to your karma. So he knows life as well as death. And there were, so one who knows all of this is also called Bhagavan. Bhagavan means uh, one who possesses sixfold Aishwarya. But then, this also, Utpattim cha vinasam cha bhutana agatim gatim vetti vidyam cha vidyam cha savacho bhagavaniti. One definition of the word bhagavan is who knows the Utpattim cha, who knows where the beings are coming and where they are going and what is the birth and what is the death, one knows. Bhutana agatim gatim, where the beings have come and what the, the destiny is going to be. Vedya Vidya Vidyamcha, who knows knowledge as well as ignorance. Meaning, what ignorance does, samsara also he knows, and knowledge also he knows. So, he knows this is called Bhagavan. Om Namo Bhagavate, to such a Bhagavan, my Namaskar. Who is the Bhagavan? Vaivasvadaya. Vaivasvadaya, which is the son of sun. Not an ordinary person. Sun means what? The embodiment of light. He stands for, in fact, Hiranyagarbha, or the very creator. So this sun symbolizes what we call Hiranyagarbha. He symbolizes the creator of the universe, who possesses all the knowledge. So all the powers are, so we have with us the power to know, the power to will, and power to act. Jnana Shakti, power to know. Icha Shakti, power to will. Kriya Shakti, or to act, each one of us possesses this power, in little measure. One possesses this power in totality. 
is is Bhagavan, Hiran Nigaranda, of yours one of the sun. And his son, not a Hrindi person. So the teacher of Gadopanisha is Vaivasvata, is Yamaraja, is Lord of Death, who is none other than the son of the all-knowing, all-powerful each Bhagavan. So that means that he also inherits those qualities. That's the idea. So sometimes you are glorified by your family name, you know. So Bush was the name. I mean, good, bad, or anything. The point is, the name goes. And that's how you get things done. Or that's how you are regarded. The whole human comes from this family, that family. Because some families are well known, either for their wealth or the nobility or for their charity or for uh, their knowledge or for their scholarship. Some people are known. So, they, oh, you were son of so and so. My grandfather was such and such. My father was such and such. You know, Swami, my father wrote this book and that book and my grandfather. Oh, then he, he also carries something from the uh, from his ancestors. And so, who is Vivaswa? Who is Vivaswa? The teacher of Kathopanishad is none other than the son of Surya. So, that way, glorifying him by referring to him through his father. Sometimes you refer to a person through the son. So I mean, here nobody, even nobody knows me as father. When you go to children's program and things like that, children are sometimes more well known than the parents naturally. So here they may know me as so this was father. They don't know me. So sometimes you are glorified by your son. Sometimes you are glorified by your father. You are glorified by your family, you know, tradition, etc. So he was glorifying the teacher as the, the progeny of Vigaswan, the son. Vrutyave is Vrutyu, embodiment of death. So the question is, how can death be the teacher? Death must be very cruel, is not so? Yamaraja, the lord of death, what is his job, you know? Is to pull out the life. And that requires a lot of cruelty. Because one thing is easy, number one, there is no favorable, and no even in Yamara, in this his court, there is no such thing as favorableness. He is Dharma Raja, meaning that he just follows the laws to the letter. And never, when the karma is over, that is gone, whoever it is. So he just pulls out the life. That is his job. Very cruel. You just say the teacher was kind and compassionate and caring. How can this cruel entity be the teacher of Brahma Vidya? And so explanation is given how Yamaraja, the Lord of Death, <coughs> he, he is the teacher of Brahma Vidya, meaning that he abides in knowledge of Brahman. Because ideally the teacher is the one who walks the talk. See, if he says that you are Brahma, I am Brahman, then that's what he is, ideally. And that's the kind of teacher that Yamaraja is. Meaning that he abides in knowledge of Brahman. That I am actionless. Neva Kinchit Karvabili, I don't know anything. Even though appearing to do something, the wise person does not do anything, as Lord Krishna described. Similarly also, Yamaraja is abiding in the wisdom. He knows his true nature, actionless self. And therefore, even though he appears to be, in fact, killing people or, 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 or snatching away their life, in fact, it is not very many, many, he doesn't have to worship. So it is not simply what you do. It is what goes behind what you do which determines the effect. Outwardly, he seems to be performing cruel action, but in his mind, there is no worship at all. There is no identification that I am doing something. And therefore, he retains his purity. Meaning that he retains his qualification of being a teacher of Brahma Vinaya because he doesn't kill. There's no cruelty. He doesn't kill. Well, he's killing everybody. No, he doesn't. Outwardly looks to But who is killing? He doesn't have a sense of worship. So even though he's Vrityu, he can still be a teacher of Brahma Vinaya and still refer, I mean, deserves our reverence and salutation. 
कोई ब्रह्म विद्याचार्य है यदि आचार्य है और ब्रह्म विद्याचार्य आचार्य मीन सी टीचर आचार्य इज अवर्ड मीन और यू रिमेम विजय का बोर्स टॉकड आचार्य है आ चुनौती शास्त्रार्थम आचार्य स्थापयन्ते अपि स्वयं आचार्य यस्मात् आचार्य इति कीर्तने कि परसर आचार्य है so this Acharya is explained as derived in different ways. One way to explain Acharya is from A plus root Chi becomes Acharya. Chi means to pluck, collect. Acharya is Shastra Artham. One who collects the Shastra Artha, the, the truth of the Shastra from many places like a Bhanimi, you know. Similarly, he is one from all the Shastra, he collects the Artha. The essence. So Acharya is the one who has the in-depth knowledge of the scriptures. Acharya is thapayatri, swayam acharya is smart, and the one who puts into practice what it is that he knows, or what it is that he teaches. Ideally, Acharya is the one who walks the talk. Well, that is also not enough. There are many Mahatmas like that. But they don't become Acharya. Acharya is Thapaya Tati. One who also makes other person do that. Meaning that the teacher makes the disciple do what is required to be done. He is not indifferent in that sense. That okay, if you learn that's all right. Do not learn. No, that's not so. Particularly the, uh, the teachers of those brahmacharis who go over studying Vyanath are very strict. Uh, we have not seen that kind of teacher, that's why we don't know. But traditionally teachers could be pretty strict. You know about Bhada Swami Swami Chinman and his teacher was Swami Tapan Maharaj. The next, when you go next day, first thing you require is to repeat what you studied yesterday. No? Go home. First thing is watching. Chinmaya, what were you doing at time? <laughs> Man, Chinmaya, that Swami <laughs> Also, is, you know, before that dessert, you can imagine that kind of teacher. <laughs> I always like to think of him because otherwise, Swami Chinmaya, he was like that, a lion. And everybody was uh, in his presence. But you can, it's nice to imagine somebody whose presence he also. <laughs> <laughs> you get that vicarious satisfaction. Okay. <laughs> they are not the only people. <laughs> but very strict. That's what they believe. They believe that it is their job to mold the student. Not like our Swami. No, no, they will learn. They will grow. They will become mature. God bless them. You know. <laughs> so some people, other people believe that we have to do that. <laughs> and therefore, they make sure that you do what is right thing to do and why what is not right to do. So there are rules and disciplines and things like that. <clears throat> Ajar is Thabayatyabe. One who establishes a students in Ajar of right conduct also. Who himself follows the conduct and also makes other conduct themselves in, in that way. So this is called Acharya. So Brahma Vidya Acharya. In Acharya Brahma Vidya. Who? This is not death. My salutation to the teacher. And one interesting thing is the last Nachiketa says. So Nachiketa is a disciple here. Yamaraja is a student and Nachiketa is a disciple. Kathopanishad is a dialogue between Yamaraja and Nachiketa. Who is Yamaraja? Lord of death. Nachiketa, the disciple. A young boy. Imagine Shankaracharya is saluting him. How great he must have been. So we'll see the greatness of this young boy. Who is, I guess, uh, was not yet entered his puberty, you know. So that was his age. They don't say, oh, Kumar. So in, uh, in Ayurveda, all these 
what is called Shishu, and also Kumar, and what is called Yuva, etc., etc. But anyway, but I imagine he may be like 12, 16 years old, 16 or so, but yeah. so he deserves the salutation from Shankaracharya. He also salutes the disciple. That's a unique thing. They always are the teacher, they always salute. But here, even the disciple also is saluted. It is because of him that this knowledge came to us. If he did not do what he did, we would not be the recipient of this knowledge. <coughs> Thus, it begins with the Mangalacharam prayer in the most salutation to the teacher and the disciple. Now the story begins. So first we are told the story. That's the question, why do you start with this guy? This is Brahma Vidya. What are you telling about this to be father and son? What? He says, well, that's to build up the context. The people have no patience. They come on, start with this. <laughs> Try the main topic. He says, wait a minute. You have to build up to the main topic. By creating a right disposition of mind in us, so that then we are ready. When it begins, then we are ready to understand what is being told. Therefore, this Upanishad in particular, Describe the story a little more elaborately. Elsewhere also the anecdotes are there, but sometimes told very briefly. Maybe a few sentences. Here a whole chapter is devoted to telling us the anecdote of the story of how it happened that Yamaraja imparted this knowledge to Nashika. <coughs> so the story begins. You reproduce the very first word of Upanishad. So let us read that. And Om should have been there, but anyway, sometimes it is written, sometimes not written. Om Ushan Ushan Hawaii Vajashravasaha Explains who is, how did he get that name Vajashravasaha? So Vajashravasaha is the son of Vajashravas or Vajashrava. The son of Vajashravas is called Vajashravasa. One is half sir, other is full sir, that's the difference. So Vajashravasaha is a person. He is the son of his father who was called Vajashrava. So, how come his name is Vajashravasa? Shravas means fame. And Vaja means Annam. So, one who was very famous because of food, because of feeding. So, one who was very famous because of distribution of food, because of feeding the people. In the Vedic times, this feeding was very, very was a great, had a great value. At all times maybe, but particularly in the times of Vedas, offering food to the needy was considered a very important thing and a very essential duty of a householder. That from the house of the householder, a person should not go back hungry. If somebody comes to your home seeking food or even shelter, overnight shelter, because if there are travelers, those days maybe there were no inns and there were no motels and stuff like that, so a householder or home was an inn, meaning that those travelers would come to your home hoping and expecting that you will be able to feed them and give them shelter. And so it was considered duty of a householder to provide shelter, provide shelter and food to those who are needy. The Ittriya clearly says 
that when somebody comes to you seeking shelter or food, you should not be turned away. The Kanchana Vasto Pratyachakshi, that Tadvratam. This is a vow of a householder that Vasati means for shelter. When somebody comes, the Pratyachakshi, that he should not be turned away. And when somebody lives with you for even for overnight, for a day, naturally you take care as so you to feed the person also. For feeding the person, you require food in your home. <coughs> oh, sorry, we have run out of it. There's no rice. There's no, that doesn't work with household. <laughs> Meaning that you must have sufficient storage of food or the grains so that you never run out of them and you are always able to feed who comes to you. So there is tasmaan daya kaya jivadaya bhakvannam prafna. Therefore, a householder should therefore store food or annam, grains, but a hookah crook, there we are allowed. Yaya kaya, why? Hoka Kruk, make sure that you have sufficient storage to feed others. So this was something considered very important those days. And this person was very famous for feeding others. <coughs> That's why he got the name Vajashravasa. So there is a person whose name is Vajashravasa. What did he do once upon a time? See, Ushan Ha. You see that? First word is Ushan. Second word is Ha. Ha is a sense of what? What they call the uh, Ha stands for history, telling you, you know, what happened once upon a time. History is for Itihasa in Sanskrit, you know. Iti, Ha, Asa. Itihasa means history. How is that word made? Iti, Ha, Asa. Iti in this manner. Asa it was. Ha, once upon a time. So her soul says, once upon a time. Once upon a time, Vajashravasa. A person or a sage whose name was Vajashravasa. Sarvedasam Dadav. Dadav he gave away. Sarvedasam, all his wealth. Once upon a time, Vajashravasa gave away all his wealth. Means that he performed a particular kind of ritual called Vishwajit ritual or Vishwajit Yaga, which requires you to give away all your wealth. I guess in those days, when a person wants to retire, give away everything. So perform a ritual which requires you to give everything away in the gift. So that kind of ritual, this Vajashra was to perform once upon a time. But, he performed ritual with an agenda. So Ushan means desiring, desiring heaven. This ritual was not done for the, just merely as a matter of offering, but it was done with an agenda that as a result of performing a ritual, I will reach heaven. What is heaven? Where there is all pleasure and no pain. This was the imagination, this was the idea or concept of heaven which is, which offers you unsullied happiness. That's, so people in, on earth know that there is no such happiness. You know, these people get fed up with their life here anyway, one way or the other. <laughs> so, they imagine a, a, a realm which is free from all conflict and all sorrow and all unhappiness. That's what heaven. The heaven was therefore the goal of life. And the rituals were prescribed to achieve that goal. And Vajasarasa was performing a ritual like that called Vishwajit, which required him to give away all the wealth and gift in order that he will reach heaven. Isn't it? All right, then what happens then? Tasya, again the ha means that, says that this, this is an anecdote. So an anecdote is being described. Nasigeta nam putrasa Tasya of this Vajashravasa Putrasa had a son whose name was Nasigeta Sanskrit word is Nasiketas. The word is Nasiketas. What will be the uh, nominative singular of Nasiketas? You don't know to answer it, but uh, there are some Sanskrit scholars here, so, you know. Nasiketa. Nasiketa. Hmm? Yes, say that again. Nasiketa. 
ऋषिकेता सेंटेंस so subject is always placed in the nominative case so nasiketa is a nominative case so subject is nasiketa that was a nominative singular nasiketa ha so but it says nasiketa is a is a printing mistake or something nasiketa asa nasiketa naam putra asa what happens to the visarga All right. So we know, now we won't worry about this Sanskrit business. You know, any problem? Right? So there are always some who are studying Sanskrit, and they are always enthusiastic in reply. So that, but apparently uh, people are not very enthusiastic. So there are circumstances where that visarga gets elided, meaning it is there but it is is not written. When so this poor visarga just by the way. Doesn't have any freedom at all. How it looks like is determined by what follows, what precedes. How it is pronounced is determined by what follows, and whether it is written or not also, and what happens to it also is determined by what follows. Sometimes it is it goes away. In this case, when it is followed by the soft consonant or or vowel, then it is belied. Sometimes the poor fellow becomes uh, O instead of Visarga, <laughs> and that. But so Visarga hardly remains Visarga. In most cases, the Visarga, you know, the two dots, it's called Visarga. In most cases, it doesn't remain Visarga. It, either it goes away, it becomes something else. Only when it is followed by a sibilant, and you know, then only it remains Visarga. Otherwise, it doesn't remain. So all along it is nasiketa, nasik. In fact, the word is nasiketa. Ha, for information. Meaning the word name, the 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 nominative singular form is nasiketa. Ha. But very rarely we will see that. Only when that word will be followed by sibilant, then only that visarga will remain. Otherwise, visarga goes. Away. So he is called nasiketa. Usually, name is called nasiketa. There is no such thing as nasiketa. Either the only pratipadi ka or the only nasiketas. So some people who are puritans they write always nasiketas. So how? What do you write in English? Should you write in English the decline word, or should you write in English the original word? Atma, we say always. Atma is not the what's the original word pratipadi ka. Atman. What is Atma? The nominative singular. Always written Atma. Brahmachari again declined. Sanyasi declined. But sometimes there are Brahman also. They write, you know. They don't write Brahma. Declined from Brahma to Brahma. So there is no consistency as to what we write in English. Sometimes we write the Pratipadika. Then undeclined original word or other, or sometimes we decline, write the decline formation. So usually we call him Nasiketa. Teacher is Yamaraja, disciple is Nasiketa. I think we should Nasiketa. We should say. We don't say Nasiketa. So Nasiketa is a disciple, and this is the setting now. The big story begins. Once upon a time, there was a sage whose name was Vardeshwara. He he. Commenced the performance of a, a ritual called Vishwajit, in which he was required to give up all his wealth. And on this, while in Sharosa, he had a son. His name was Nachiketa. Then what happens? That story further describes. We'll continue. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purna Purnamudashade. Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamevavashishyade Om Shanti 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 Shankaram Shankaram
शंकराचार्यम केशवम बादरायनम सूत्रभाष्यक तो वंदे भगवंतो नमः ईश्वरो गुरुरात्मेति मूर्ति वेद विभागिने व्योम व्याप्त देहाय दक्षिणामूर्त